Okay, welcome to lecture two for CS235, Applied Robot Design for Non-Robot Designers. We're going to start out with just a few administrative things, such as moving this giant card out of your way. <coughs> so, um, I sent out an email about SolidWorks installation. I haven't counted all the responses, but it looks like most of you have signed up. If you haven't yet signed up online, please do so. Uh, can anyone raise their hand if they did not receive an email from me about SOLIDWORKS installation and you are enrolled in the class? Good. Okay. Um, those of you who, so I sent out two emails. One was just BCCing everyone from the official class list. The other was Stanford's internal list. It seems a little buggy because I think a couple of you didn't get it. If you didn't receive both emails last night from me, they were pretty much identical, except one said this one's not identical, which, anyway. Uh, please come after class and let me know, and we'll try to work that out. So I'm going to hand these out. Could anyone who is enrolled in the class please raise your hand? I will go ahead and apologize now. I have a terrible time with names and faces. So I might be calling you Bob and Bobette for a month. I apologize. It's nothing personal. Um, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so what you were holding in your hands is a safety form that is required to be filled out to work in the Clark Center. It doesn't take long. It's about a one hour safety training. We'll, we'll let that settle for a second. I've got, I've got a few in my hand that need to be in someone else's hand. Over here. Okay. Yeah, and you should see my signature on two different pages. I went through about three of them. So those two signatures can go back to the back. So just real quick, please. Thanks. Okay, we're apparently we're missing two people. Uh, go ahead and fill those out real quick. So uh, the sanity check is that uh, Ken's signature is on the first page and on the last page. The only safety uh, that you're going to be doing is the top one called general safety. So please put a check mark next to that and write the word only for number one. Check mark only unless you want to do 12 hours of unrelated safety training. Okay, so everybody hopefully is turned to the, the sort of gray and white uh, table. Next to number one, it should say general safety. Go ahead and put a check mark next to that and write the word only. Yes. Uh huh. Check mark on the yes box. Uh, no. They will, they will be grumpy about that because a lot of you aren't new to Stanford. Just to the left of it in the margin, write, uh, write only. If you do the new to Stanford, they might make you do some new to Stanford crap as well. Right mm -hmm. this, this is what is reminding them that we've already told them and that they've already promised that you only have to take general safety, but I guarantee if you don't write it, then you'll be doing 12 hours of compressed gas and biohazards and lasers galore, which we're not going to be doing. So. Should we lie about number three? Hmm? Uh, number three says, do you work on a computer for more than one hour per day? Just do number one only. Trust me, you don't want to give them any excuse to give you more training. Number one only. You don't fill out anything else? Nope. That's it. Leave everything else blank. The only thing on the first page is the word only next to number one, the name, date, and signature, and student ID. Then you turn to the last page. Once that's done. Student ID is the number or the email? Yeah, so the student ID is your number on your student ID card. So it's like seven digits or something. All right, everybody's here. Sweet. Hmm. Two. Nothing on section two. Turn all the way to the back. The last part where you have Ken's signature. I believe you're just uh, signing at the bottom where it says cardholder signature. This was a labor of love for Ken to sit and sign a giant stack of these repeatedly. 
<laughs> we weren't even allowed to use a rubber stamp, so it did take forever. Ruben, on that last page, do mm -hmm. to say room and then another signature? Uh, no, they're going to write that in for us. Okay. Uh, and then um, if you have... Do we put our name and stuff on the top of that page? Huh? Do we print our name and... I think, can I see for a sec? Yeah. Let me borrow this. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, you got to do all that. Uh, so just do your name. I guess title is student or Mr. I don't know. How about Mr. Student or Miss Student? <laughs> Doctor student. Doctor student is good too. Department, whatever your home department is. I don't know what office location is. And then, uh, oh man, this is going to take forever. And then you're going to check the university box and say expires uh, June 13th, 2012. I promise the rest of the lecture will be a lot more entertaining than this. Turn in there. I'll turn them in. They go back to you. Uh huh. All right. So real quick, everybody, on the last page, check the university box in the section where it says you know, other ID type. You're going to check university, and then for expires, you're going to write six thirteen two thousand twelve. It's basically the end of the quarter. And the, the department is whatever you are, M, uh, M E C S E E Aero, Astro, et cetera, et cetera. Do you have to put the building area to be accessed? No, I'm going to take care of that. Well, I'm going to make them write it down because it's got like a weird number on it, and I don't remember that number. Just so you know, you're only getting card access to the back door uh, immediately adjacent to our lab. So if it's after hours and you go to another door at Clark, it won't work. So don't get frustrated. It's the back door immediately next to... Uh, our lab, they've got, I'll, I'm going to post pictures just so you see where the door is. But. What time does it go uh, The building locks at 6 o'clock. And probably a lot of your prototyping will be at or after 6 o'clock, especially towards the end. Okay, so let's go through a quick checklist. Can I use yours? Everyone turn with me, please, to page one. You should have printed your name. Your numeric Stanford ID, today's date, 4412. Next to number one on the left margin, written the word only. Everybody got that? Then on the last page, you should have printed your legal name, written some type of contrived title, put your home department, checked the checkbox university, and written expires 61312. You should have Dr. Salisbury's signature and date here, and finally you signed at the bottom. Now, can anyone see anything that I'm missing we need to fill in? I see some official use only. They're going to they're gonna write in the building area only. I think that's it. I think we're good. We need to check the employee access to Clark already. Huh? I have access to Clark already. Okay. Well, we, we can, yeah, just turn in. So if we're coming for SolidWorks tonight, do we need to be let in? Uh, yes. Okay. How should we do that? I'll call my cell phone. Okay. Call a lab phone. Call a lab phone. The lab phone is listed on the syllabus online. You can call either the cell phone or my lab number, and then I'll come get you. <coughs> so is everybody done? Let's pass them forward. So I will turn these in, and they're going to look them over. Hopefully we won't have any revisions. I already have access to Clark, but like the rest layer. We'll just turn it in for a second. Okay. That's, that's fine. So, and what do we add in employee ID? Nothing? Or? No, that's good. That's good. Mm -hmm. Okay, just pass them to the sides. If we screwed something up, then maybe on Monday we'll be editing these. Hopefully not. So I'm going to turn these in, and then I believe you do your training on Axis. Has everyone turned that in? Can you raise your hand if you haven't? Okay. Okay. Just a reminder, uh, when you come to install SOLIDWORKS, please bring your uh, check for the lab fee. 
Uh, I know some of you forgot your checkbooks. That's fine. I never keep mine on me. But um, if you owe me a check, please bring it at SawWorks installation. And if you haven't signed up, please do so. Um, so we need to, uh, now, once everyone has SOLIDWORKS, we basically need to teach you how to use it. So the options are you can either do a random tutorial you find online that will take forever and not do a good job, or we can just do it as a class. I'd like to do it as the latter, and particularly because I'd like to actually start the homework in the training session. That is, we're not going to be making random parts in the training session. We're going to be making parts from your homework, and that way you'll get a head start, and it will be relevant material. So I was hoping to do that probably tomorrow night. Now I haven't, uh, it's been kind of crazy, so I haven't gotten a chance to cross-reference everyone's schedule. So can we do a show of hands? Uh, we could do it anywhere from, I don't know, 5 p.m. on up. Can anyone not make any time on Thursday night? Three, four, five. Well, the hands are oscillating. Let's keep them up for a sec. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Um, I know this is lame. How about Friday night? That was six. No. Two. I figured. I'm just asking. I'm just asking. <laughs> How about uh, Thursday afternoon? Oh. Be four or five o'clock. Uh, we want to put up Google Hangouts so that people can just join remotely. Yeah, we may need to do that. Can any? Uh, well. I mean, the longer it is, the more of your homework will do, and the, and the faster you will ramp up in terms of knowing how to do it. I propose probably doing around three or four hours. Um, that's not me being draconian. I really do want to help you guys get a head start. Otherwise, the, if we don't do a long training, the homework's going to take it much, much longer. Um, we do basically need to get it done by, by Monday so that you can actually do the assignment. So, yes? Videotaping doesn't really work. I guarantee you that uh, everyone's going to have, unless you've already used it a ton, everyone's going to have little issues, which is completely understandable. I mean, they have entire courses on SOLIDWORKS. Um, can anyone not make Saturday, say afternoon or evening? Okay, so here's what I propose doing. I propose we do two training sessions, and then hopefully we can fit everybody in. If necessary, we'll do three. I under it's sort of, this course is, is sort of... Um, sort of curved like this. It's high at the beginning and high at the end for the project, and in the middle it's not so bad. But we have to get set up. So uh, I'll send out an email, and I propose probably Thursday night, Saturday afternoon, and if we still have stragglers, Sunday afternoon. We should be able to accommodate everybody. But does everyone think, raise your hand if you don't think you can make one of those three times on Thursday night, Saturday afternoon, or Sunday afternoon? How late is Thursday? Uh, whatever time would work well for you, maybe 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock. Okay. In the absence of hands, it looks like we can probably squeeze everybody in. So I'll, I'll set up an email and ask you to pick your preference. Do you guys prefer to do, on Saturday and Sunday, would you prefer afternoon or evening? Morning. Morning and afternoon. And on Thursday, would you prefer afternoon or evening? Evening. And how late of an evening? Would you Six, seven, ten, something? Seven. 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 Okay. So we'll do Thursday at seven and maybe Saturday and Sunday around 11 a.m. Okay. The next item is PRL safety training. We have to get this done. Now, uh, once we're done with the, with the PRL safety training, the Clark safety training, and the SOLIDWORKS training, we're, we're home free. So that's the good news. The bad news is we still have to do all this. So. Um, we're probably going to do, again, three uh, training sessions. They only take 10 people at a time in the PRL. Craig Miller has been nice enough to say that he will schedule special times for us as a group because it's a lot harder to get everyone to go here and then. So um, I will, let's see, and we need to finish it this week. Of the remaining days this week, um, can we have a show of hands for morning people? Morning is uh, 10 a. Uh, how about 10 a.m. to noon? You've already safety trained. It's just one year. Thing. Yeah. If you've already, uh, okay. Raise your hand if you've done PRL safety training within the last 12 months. Ooh, hey, that's awesome. Okay, so we have fewer people than we expected. Okay, of the remaining people who have not had PRL safety training in the last year, um, who would like to do it on some morning in the remaining days of this week? 
an hour and a quarter. That's about half of you. Who would prefer, to, I guess, the rest are afternoons because they're not open in the evening. Okay, so um, I will send out an email about that too. And uh, I'm going to send it to everyone because I, I didn't record all of your hands. Please uh, respond back to me if you already have up-to-date training so that we don't have to schedule you. Okay, so that's all of the sort of annoying stuff, and now let's do some fun. So we ended last time with bearings, with ball bearings, and can anybody tell me why we're using uh, ball bearings? There are two reasons. Friction. There were friction. Constraints. Constraining motion. Excellent. And so you know, we, we went through most of it, but I had a few more demos I wanted to show you. Um, so... There are three main types of bearings in terms uh, of just normal ball bearings in terms of how they sit against a material. I have different colors today. So uh, say you have a block of material and that's a hole. And then from the front section, it looks like this. Okay? We would like to stick a ball bearing right here and this is the side view. So, uh, this is part of the bearing. Uh, let me draw that in a different color. So this is just a block of, block of material. And actually, you know what? Let's do this. I'm going to go ahead and hand out. Today we have little demos. If you're enrolled in the class, please take one of these. Um, uh, I apologize to those of you who are not enrolled. I don't, I barely had enough. Um, just kind of pass those back. Pass these down, please. So here's the thing. If you're sitting next to someone who's auditing, it looks very sad because they don't have bearings of their own. Please be nice and share with them. Otherwise, the tooth fairy will be less kind. Have some? Okay, pa just pass these around. Done? Okay. I'm going to let you all uh, s s settle who has what. <laughs> I have a baggie too. Okay. So, do, uh, does anyone who is enrolled in the class not have one of these? Can we please fill in the gaps? I, I know that there are exactly enough for everyone. I counted them. Anybody still missing one? We're good. Okay, so take out the little wood block. That material is called MDF. I think that's medium density fiberboard. Now the reason we're using MDF just for this is because it's thick and really flat and really um, has very good repeatability in terms of dimension. So when you buy a piece of plywood and it says quarter inch, how thick is it? Less. Plus or minus, usually very minus. So I think the plywood we have downstairs is like 5.7 millimeters, and it ranges anywhere up to 6 millimeters. And every time you get a different piece, it's completely different. If you go to Osh and you get three quarter, actually this isn't three quarter, something else, but it, trust me, it is three quarter. Uh, it's the same time and time again to within pretty high tolerance, I mean 0.05 millimeter. Uh, and also when you have a big, say you wanted to, I don't know, make a cut out of me smiling, looking beautiful, you want it to be flat. Um, and plywood won't do that. It's very warped. It's very moisture sensitive. This is not. This is, remains very flat. So if you're ever interested in building large tables or frames for robots, three-quarter inch MDF is the way to go. The other reason is because we can press fit bearings in from front and back with only one cut. So everyone take out your ball bearings. Now can anyone remind me why we're using two ball bearings instead of one? 
Yes, excellent. We're getting rid of this floppy motion. And why aren't we using three? Because three is surely greater than two. Over-constrained. Over-constrained, exactly. It's a four-legged table with no compliance. Okay, so please don't press fit them in yet. I want you to take w one bearing and uh, feel, you know, it, it doesn't want to go in on one side. Take the other bearing and feel how much it doesn't want to go in on the other side. And someone uh, please tell me if there is a difference, and if so, what there is between the two sides. So one side is smaller than the other, mm -hmm. um, in terms of how much the bearing actually goes in. And I think when the laser cutter made it cut, it's kind of like... Perfect! Yeah, it's kind of like yes! Much, yes! Much, yes. Much. yes! That's excellent. So the laser cutter is not a perfect cylinder. One might expect it to be, but it's not. So it's basically focused light, and even though it's very focused very nicely, it's not. So you'd expect some cylinder to come down like this, right? But instead, basically, you have a cone on one side and a cone on the other, and this is the focal point. And so if this is, if this is um, what you're cutting, if this point isn't dead center in the middle of the board, then our cone's going to intersect the top and bottom faces at different points, and so we're going to have different diameters. So just for the sake of argument, say this is our board, and we focus right here on the tip, and this is our cone. And now say we focus only at the bottom, So everyone can see that the dimensions are going to be different between these two cases, right? Because we, we, what we want is the diameter of the whole top and bottom to be identical, but it's not because we're focusing in the wrong place. Everybody see that? So what we want is right here, dead center, so this hole is exactly the same diameter top and bottom. This is pretty good, actually. It's a fairly amazing that you can press fit ball bearings through a three-quarter inch material top and bottom. Um, but any time that you're trying to design uh, things that are laser cut, where you're trying to use the precision of the cut, top and bottom, it's empirical. You're, you may not get lucky, depending on the material. Maybe it's not MDF, maybe it's plywood, maybe it's thick plywood, maybe it's ABS, maybe it's uh, acrylic is terrible at this. If you laser cut acrylic this thick, you cannot press fit top and bottom. You only get one side. So that's why I'm saying this is important. For MDF, it's pretty good. Okay. So, ABS is a type of plastic. So, so how, do you, is it, how does it cut? I mean, what's this? So, laser cutting uses the heat from light to burn away the material. So, just imagine a giant blowtorch, and then we're just going to move it around, on, um, and the computer is going to tell us, okay, go this way in X, go this way in Y, by how many millimeters. And so, we're, we're cutting paths, right? So, okay, so it's, like, it's like a giant plotter. And, and this so, so why do you why do you have the whole cone thing there? Because uh, it's a, col a a laser beam should be a perfect cylinder of light, but it's not. Light has to be focused with optics, and if the optics aren't a hundred percent, yes. Oh yeah. It's 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 um, um, imagine that. Um, I see. Oh yeah yeah. It's really thin. It's yeah. Thin it's extremely thin. So. So this is cartoonish. Let's back up for a sec. This is really freaking tiny. This is about 0 0.01 uh, inches in diameter. Does everybody know what phi means in terms of mechanical design? It's diameter. So the diameter of the beam is about 10 thousandths theoretically. So these cone and and this is I don't know what the angular spec is on it. It's very good, but it is enough that for three quarter inches there's going to be a difference of maybe half a thousandth of an inch in terms of the overall diameter of the bearing. So, um, yes, everyone feels that one side is a little tighter than the other, right? And that's because of the, just the focal problem. So, now that we've been reminded why we're using pairs of bearings, can someone tell me, uh, A, when you look at your bearing, there are two big diameters. One of it's pretty thick, pretty wide, and the other's pretty thin. Anybody know what that thin part's called? Let me draw it out for you. So, 
Look at your bearing by the side profile. And I'm talking about this. Flange. And why do we use flanges? Because otherwise it would just punch all the way through the material. So basically, this bearing can go anywhere in here. If I don't put a flange here, it's just, it's just going to fall through. So if I just have a plate with a hole in it, and I want to stick this bearing on the front of it, the way that the bearing knows to, hey, I'm in, don't push anymore, is this little flange. Okay, but we don't have to have that. We could have uh, a um, unflanged bearing. And so I'm going to go ahead and pass, uh, let's just pass these around, I'll do half. Now these I need to keep. These are expensive bearings. What does MDF stand for? Medium density fiber board. Okay, so as, well, I'll wait until you, um, until you do this. Now what you'll notice about these other bearings is that they don't have a flange. So somebody tell me, um, let's erase, let's do over here. So again, this is the same, the same board side profile. What, how should I modify this drawing so that I can stick a bearing with no flange and it will be flush here and it won't fall out? Stoppers inside. Exactly. Okay, everyone see this? So now when I draw my bearing, we'll do it in green. Okay, this little lip in here keeps it from going too far. Now we just we need to make sure that diameter there, and then if we looked this way on, we'd see an additional circle, which is basically everyone see why there's the second circle? Okay. Now we can still pass a shaft through here as long as that that little lip is a lot bigger than the shaft. So say this is an eight millimeter shaft. So eight millimeter, and then this bearing uh, the diameter is twenty two millimeters. Uh, you know, we'd want this to be probably at least nine millimeters so that we get one millimeter of clearance with the shaft. Okay, so that is, has everyone seen the unflanged bearing? No? People who are, you know, be nice to your neighbors. People are shaking their heads and looking sad. Um, we have a third one. Yes? Um, so the shaft has to fit this inner uh, ring, right? Mm -hmm. So the lip has to be less than... Exactly. So let, let's, let's dissect this a little bit. Can everyone see over here? Okay, so I'm gonna, we're going to take our assembly and in your mind, turn it sideways, and now we're going to cut it in half. And so what we're looking at is we're looking at it in half. So this is our plate. This is that piece of, of wood you've got in front of you. Okay. And now, uh, in a different collar, we have the bearing. So what is this, what is this green section called, anyone? Outer. Outer race. Okay. Well, what does this symbol mean? Grounded. Ground, which means what? It doesn't move, it's fixed. Okay. So now... What are these? What are these two things? You know what? I'm being mean and not using a different color. I'm gonna use brown instead. What? What was I drawing? Inner race. Very good. Okay. And then in black. I mean, is is this large enough that you guys can see the details of it? Okay. And then these are the the balls. Okay. So your question is the shaft. That's painful. It's like an orca being strangled. Okay. So this shaft is basically the same size as the inner race, right? It's a slip fit. Slip fit is usually around three to four, two to four thousandths uh, difference in diameter. So um, 
for the one and only time, I'll switch to inch for a sec. Say that this is, um, is 0.25 inches diameter. Then uh, let's make that for the, for the inner race. For the shaft, that would be 0.25 minus. Then we'd do anywhere from 2 thousandths to 4 thousandths. In your mind, basically, it's the exact same diameter. Okay, so now let's take away this flange. We're, we're good here. Does everyone see that this is perfectly fine other than we don't have a second one here? Just mirror copy it in your head. But now uh, we don't want to use a flange bearing. So get rid of the flange. And we're going to add a little uh, thing here. Okay. Does everyone see that this purple thing is keeping the green thing from being pushed too far? And now can you also see we're only touching the outer race. We're not touching the inner race. So the inner race is still free to spin freely uh, and uh, doesn't touch the shaft. So that's how that works. Now, everyone who has seen the flangeless bearing, take another close look at it. Does it look like maybe it's a different aspect ratio than the flange bearings that you have? Look at the difference in terms of the overall width of the bearing, like the thickness, and then also the difference between the inner and the outer diameter. And somebody tell me what's the difference? Thinner. It's been on a diet. So these are called thin section bearings. And you use them when you don't have a whole lot of space. So. Um, there are lots of applications where you want thin section bearings. They're expensive, much, much more expensive. than, And the bigger they get, the more expensive they get. Now we're starting to talk like, you know, those there are probably 15 bucks a pop. The little flange bearings are three bucks a pop. This, which is a thin section bearing, everybody see this? This is 400 bucks. They get expensive. And there's a big difference between metric and imperial. What's imperial? Inches. Inches, okay. Big difference in terms of pricing and availability and even strength between metric and imperial. Here's a big thing. Um, what is uh, an, eighth of a di an eighth of an inch in millimeters? You're going to get to know these numbers real well. Okay, so this is an eighth of an inch. And this bearing, this is, you know, I want an inner diameter of uh, an eighth of an inch. And then I want another one that's metric, and the closest one is three millimeters. So they're basically the same bearing, okay? And we're going to say it's flanged. The loads that this bearing can take when you buy it are four times higher than the loads for here. Now, I have no clue why. I'm not a bearing engineer. But I know when you go to McMaster or you go to Dyna Roll, et cetera, or uh, National Precision Bearings, and you look up, a three millimeter bearing and an eighth inch bearing, and you compare the radio and the axial loads, the three millimeter one is only 25% as strong as the eighth inch one. And now if any of you by the end of the court can tell me why, I will both thank you and probably pay you something. But um, It's marketing. I think it's like an actual keyword to test it. I'm sure it's the same strength. Yeah, it's like, oh, yeah, I hate metric. They're weak. Metric's weak. But um, so this, it matters to know things like this. There's a difference between metric, uh, not only in terms of strength. So let's write that up there. So this is times four stronger. And what directions would it be stronger in? Two of them. Axial and radial. And if I were to draw a ball bearing here, um, somebody tell me I've got two axes. What's axial? And this is radial. Okay. The other reason this matters is price. And I, there, there isn't, a, this is like a lookup table. And it, only, it just takes doing it over and over and over to figure it out. It's not like, okay, metrics cheaper or big is more expensive. It completely matters, you know, if it's imperial or metric and what size and flange or not flange. There are some trends, but mostly it's a lookup table that you just have to learn. But keep in mind, just because you have a general size or a general configuration doesn't mean it will be one price. You need to look around to see if you're cost conscious what makes sense. So the reason I'm mentioning all of this is this next bearing. And I only have one of them, so I have to just show it to you. 
Okay, we're trying a new camera today, by the way. Let me know how it goes. Well, currently it's unfocused. Okay, can everyone see this one? Okay, and do you see that the flange is not at the edge of the bearing? So I'm going to spin it here. Dude, this is kinematically inverted. This is confusing. I'm very upset by this. This is like an IQ test or something. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to spin the bearing. See that? It's not at the edge of the bearing. So this is called a retaining ring. The reason why this matters is, did everyone see what that was? Okay, I'm going to draw it to you. This is called a retaining ring. So the way this works, and we'll do two drawings again. Actually, I'll come over here now. So, if this is the bearing, they take the flange that was here and move it that way. So now it's like this. Okay? Now the way that they don't machine this, your flanged bearing, take a look at it. Take a look at the flange, flip it over so you can see in the corner where it was cut. And you'll see they machined that. They didn't add that on. It's not like clay that you add on later. They cut that out. And it's very expensive to cut that out. It's an extra step beyond what they had to do for the unflanged bearing. So flanged bearings, because there's more machining, means in terms of price they're more expensive, a lot. These bearings without flanges are uh, 50 cents a pop. And with flanges, they're $1.50. Uh, sorry, three bucks. So, huge difference. Now, thin section bearings, you cannot get flanged, usually at all. They don't exist. The ones that do exist are for very special purposes, and they're super ridiculously expensive. The cheap way that you get around this is the retaining ring bearing. Because what they do is they take that thin section bearing there, and they cut it, and they insert a retaining ring. So rather than it being one piece, that they, they machined out. So this is the unflanged bearing. They stick it in a special machine that cuts a little slot. Okay, so now this is what my bearing, my retaining ring looks like without it. And then they insert what's called a retaining ring, which is just a little thin piece of metal. And if we were looking, this retaining ring looks like this, it's, uh, it's almost, wow, it looks terrible, it's almost a circle and it snaps on. And it, it's free to move a little bit, but once you install it with pressure, it's just as good as a flange bearing, but A, they exist for thin section, and B, it's like a tenth of the cost. And I know this because my dissertation robot uses several of these, and I spent like a week looking for them. They, they literally don't exist. So, uh, to recap, if you're using a ball bearing, there are three types of seating them. And by se uh, what does seating mean? It means the bearing sitting in the hole. So w when you seat a bearing, you sit it down in the hole. There's flanged, which uses the flange to what? Okay, now we take away the flange, it's unflanged. And now we have to add something in the middle, a little lip, and then say we want flanged, but it's thin section because we're, we need it to be compact, but it either doesn't exist or it's too expensive, we do retaining ring. There's one last type I want you to see. This is pretty extreme. So we, we take the thin section bearing and we grow it even more. And now it's just ridiculous. And they manufacture these usually somewhat differently. This is called a turntable. If any of you been to a fairly authentic Chinese restaurant where there's a, a lazy Susan uh, where they pass the food around, it's always one of these underneath it. These are actually pretty cheap. I mean, they're crappy. They don't make these to high tolerances because, you know, for eating at your table. Um, but these are also found in missile launchers. So when I was working at Lockheed Martin, we had one of these in this well, missile launcher, and it was like 5,000 bucks for something about this size. And it can also take a grown elephant jumping on it. It's very, very strong. So that's thin section, expanded, missile grade, or Chinese food grade. <laughs> and um, uh, either really expensive or really cheap. So that's bearings. Um, now what we're going to do to get the blood flowing is look in your bag again. 
and you have all the makings of a little bearing assembly. You have four little pieces of metal that look identical and then one that looks different. So what are the little silver pieces of metal? Uh, well, they're a kind of washer. What kind of washer? They're spacers. Somebody, there are lots of names. Don't be shy. Everybody shout out a different permutation for what these might be called if you went on McMaster to find them. Shim. Nah, not really. They might be called a precision washer, maybe, but probably not. Inner, okay, inner race spacer, inner race shim. Ball bearing shim, ball bearing spacer, maybe. That one's questionable. Okay, and then the last thing, the black thing, um, is uh, that's not flat. So squish it between your palm and your finger. That is a Belleville washer. That's what I drew at the end of last class that um, was a little hard to, to see. So I could draw it again, but that's just not going to help anybody. So I need everyone one by one to come up, and we're just going to assemble this right here and now. So first open the little baggies. Those are shaft collars. Remember what the shaft collars do? They, they constrain the bearing so it doesn't move around. <clears throat> now, do not use your teeth. I use my teeth for everything except for anything to do in the lab. Because there's nastiness on the inside of that. There's grease and cancer and bad stuff, so don't use your teeth. Use your keys or use your pen or just rip it, but do not use your teeth. So the the keys the keys trick is awesome if you haven't if you haven't done that before. It's not precision engineering, but it's good. Okay, so those of you who uh, have have opened them, um, take your shaft and stick it into one of your bearings. I personally sanded these all for you about two hours ago, so I know they all fit. Now they barely fit. You'll notice on parts it glides smoothly, on parts it doesn't. That's partly because I suck at sanding. But uh, that's, that's kind of an interference fit. Interfe so there are three main types of fit. There's press fit, which is where it doesn't come back out without a lot of force. There's slip. The fact that you can move those back and forth, that means that's a slip fit. There's interference. That's sort of halfway in between the two of these. So just take the average. As in, it's not particularly easy to install, but you can do it. Maybe you need a little bit of pressure, but you can also bring it back out by hand. Practically, just nix this. Now, if you go and look at a machinist's handbook, you'll find like 10 others. There's no reason. We're not machinists. We shouldn't be machinists. We should know how to machine. We should know how to give machine drawings. But may anyone, any good machinist worth their salt, you're going to tell them a press fit, or you're going to tell them a slip fit, and you're going to tell them how much. Now, these all have tolerances. So uh, say I have a block here. Actually, we'll just use your block. Your block was made to be 22 millimeters whole. And the bearing that you have is a 22 millimeter outer diameter. So the, the fact that you have to uh, use pressure to insert that makes sense, right? These are the identical size. There's no room. You have to press it in because there's no way to wiggle it, right? So that's why it's a press fit. And if we were going to go even more, Maybe we could make this this a uh, whole little um, a little smaller, and it would be more force to get it in. It turns out there are tolerances for this. So, for a shaft, um, for this, you would actually say I want this to be minus uh, or plus zero 
and minus point uh, oh two millimeters. So does anyone know what this means? These are machining tolerances. Tell me what the zero means. Plus zero. It won't be any more than that. Exactly. It will never be bigger than 22 millimeters. And then what does minus uh, po uh, 0 0.02 millimeters mean? It can't be smaller than minus that. And so machinists have figured out basically that, that oh, you know, what type of fit that is. And these, these have different terms like H7, little H's, big H's. Um, I'm not going to go into that. That's in the category of things it would be nice for you to know a year from now, but not for this course. They're very important, but for now, don't worry about them. For now, what you need to know is press fit means we're not putting it in by hand, we're not taking it out by hand, as in like with your fingernails. Slip fit means you're able to slide it back and forth. Everybody slide back and forth. That's a slip fit. Okay, so I want you to take your two bearings. Uh, and your uh, block of wood, and one by one come up here. And we're going to get up and we're going to use this. This is an arbor press. This is your best friend after your dog. Um, the way it works is it's got this lever here, and this is what we're going to learn about this mechanism today. It's a rack and pinion. And basically, we're just going to mash that bearing into the block of wood. So, everybody come up. I'll help you do it. And we're going to try to be as fast as we can so we don't slow down the lecture too much. You already assembled. Oh, not quite. Please don't have your shaft in your bearings when you come up. So here's what you do. I'm going to put it right here, okay? And then you're going to press down like that, okay? Now actually give me one, give me one sec. Okay, when you're using the arbor press, you do not want to just press nakedly against the bearing because you're going to scratch the bearing and mar it up. And I desperately need something flat. So basically, you're going to have a sacrificial lamb in between it. Um, I wish I had a lamb with me. No, I need something flat. Oh, my wood, my wood. Is that my wood? Okay, we'll use this. That's not thick enough. We'll use this. Okay, this is our lamb. So you're going to put this in between, and now you got to center this bearing over it, and now go ahead and press down. Okay, and now... Whoop. It's okay. Now go ahead, raise it up a little bit, and just kind of hit it, just, just you know, a little bit, like, like this. There you go. Okay. That's just kind of jiggling it to. It's kind of like when you kick your TV and it starts working. Okay. Now take it out, and you're done. You've press fit your bearing. Congratulations. <laughs> we only put one in. Uh, we're gonna do both. Okay. So first you're gonna do one side. Sacrificial lamb. Center it up. Okay. <laughs> yep, good. Okay, flip it over. Maybe a little hard. Sorry. It's okay. These bearings are really hard to break. That's why you've got them. If you did this to a three millimeter bearing, you'd be buying a new bearing. <laughs> Just so you know, um, yeah, so, so when you're press fitting stuff like this, you want to get it started a little bit by hand, because if it's at too extreme of an angle, it won't go. It'll just basically gnash into the, the side. Okay. So what I would do, if, if you're having trouble getting it started, seat it kind of like that, and kind of do that. Okay, I'll hold this for you. You also, it's usually a good idea to have someone helping you with this, because one person aligns it, and then the other person presses. Thanks. I have people I bug every day about helping me. Okay, you're aligned. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Good, okay. That's done. Awesome. Okay, we're lining it up. Sacrificial lamb. Okay, good. And one more. Uh, no, you need the bearing. 
Okay. Okay. So this is what your spotter is for. They're supposed to align it. Ooh. Okay. Yeah, we're good. Uh, these ones doesn't matter. Okay, go ahead. Hold on. Yeah, you're good. Good. That's good enough right there. That's good. So one of the reasons why this is going so easily is because this is a soft, forgiving material, MDF. The bearing is a lot, a lot harder than the material. And so misalignments get taken care of by the bearing sort of self-aligning. Okay? Thanks. If you were trying to do this in aluminum, you would want to be a lot more careful about this. If you did this in aluminum, it would not work. We would not be dealing with aluminum here. If you're doing it in, st in steel, I feel badly for you. I've done it repeatedly and it's never pleasant. Hold up. Okay, do it again. Okay. All right. Now those of you who are waiting, uh, we'll wait on that. Okay. Anybody want to tell me why this would be a lot harder in aluminum and steel? No. Try again. Okay. Yes. It's really hard to line up. Okay. What's the other reason? Huh? It's really hard to do this. A lot harder to do this in aluminum because it's less forgiving. The difference in terms of stiffness and hardness between aluminum. And uh, steel is a lot lower than the difference between steel and wood. Okay, we keep going. That's good enough. Okay. Second one. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hey, yes. Okay. Right. Yep. Okay. That's it. Awesome. So everybody, see how simple this is? Uh, up a little. Okay. Okay, press the lever. Awesome. Okay. Got more. Here, so you get the handle. It's your spotter's job to align it. And it's your job to not kill the spotter's fingers. Please. Hold up. Go ahead. Yep. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. It's okay, these are a little. Okay. Hard to line up. Okay. Good. All right. Okay. 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 Yep. Thank you for asking. Okay. Everybody else. And the other end. <laughs> okay. Go ahead and line it up. Okay. All right. Line it up. Okay. Uh, try again. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Oh, one side is partially in, but this side is. Okay. So let's do one at a time. Okay. So how do we make Go sure ahead. that the shaft will still align? Because there might be some alignment changes when you add the bearing. Uh, we'll we'll discuss that. Okay. 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 Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Sorry. 
Uh -huh. Go ahead and line the other one. Okay. 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 Perfect. Okay. You're in. The other one just slides in. Okay. Okay. Congratulations, everyone. That's your first. Use of Arbor Press and a press fit and installing two ball bearings. Now, a couple notes. You all did really well, and this is not to criticize. This is to save the poor bearings that come after this. About half of you were not already in. So, this is called the ram, the long thing that moves. It's supposed to be in contact with whatever you're trying to press when you start applying pressure. Okay? Anyone know why? Noise. Almost. Otherwise, it's uh, it's a a sort of a it might slip out before yeah, might slip out. It, it's basically an impact load. Otherwise, if it's not in contact, not in contact, big force. That's bad. It will uh, uh, jar your bearing. It'll fall out. Maybe it'll go in. It'll go in, but it'll smush at a weird angle. Um, so always, always, always have this ram already lightly resting on uh, whatever you're trying to press before you start pressing. Now, as I instructed you, a lot of you, after you were done, so basically, say my bearing is right here, and you want to press slowly. Don't press quickly. The same reason. If you press quickly, it might slip or move. So Pre use a hammer. Do not use a hammer on bearings. That is, that is a, was a venial sin. So now we go all the way down. And then you start doing this, right? That's cool. Be gentle. It's, it's just, uh, it's, we're kicking the TV, but very gently. And you don't start out with this. Some of you are starting out with that. So to review, you start out in contact, build up the pressure. Imagine you're trying to ease the way in. You don't want anything to move or vibrate loose. Go slowly. After it's all the way in, gentle, small motions, and then build the force as you get more confident. The other thing is, some of you, the reason it wasn't going in at first is because the bearing wasn't directly underneath the ram. You, you want to spend, if you need to, 10 times the amount of time aligning whatever you're press fitting than actually using the ram. Because you only get one shot for most press fits. So make sure it's perfectly centered. Everybody know what I mean by that? Okay. And uh, the last thing is only one of you said, hey, Ruben, you ready? I'm not upset. That's okay. It's your first time, but I want all of you to have your fingers and thumbs at the end of this week. So uh, you want to be using this in pairs. You don't want to use this by yourself. It's not a safety issue. The worst thing you're going to do is smush your finger and it can be sore for a day. It's a part safety issue. If you do it by yourself, you're going to be juggling everything, and it, this is the easiest you're ever going to press fit, guaranteed. For the Lab 1, it's a lot bigger parts, and it's trying to angle on you. Lab one, always work this in pairs. Your spotter is supposed to align it. You're supposed to be talking, and here's how it goes. Hey, you ready? Ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Wait, wait, no, no, it's moving a little bit. Slow down, okay, okay. You need to ask them are they ready, because if you surprise them, the parts are gonna slip out, you're gonna mush their fingers, and your parts gonna get ruined. Okay, please put the shaft between the two bearings. Actually, first hold it up and inspect it. The way you inspect this to make sure that the bearings are flush is if you see any gap, between the wood and the bearing, then it's not installed all the way. Now, it's hard to tell that with the naked eye. So the trick is, and we have these down the, in the uh, lab, you shine a flashlight on the reverse side and then you stare into it. If you see light, there's a gap. If you don't see light, there isn't a gap. If you need to turn out the lights to help, that's fine. Flashlight is your best friend for this. If you really want, you can use a special razor blade I can get you, but that'll be good enough. So everybody look up at it, look at the side. Now, there is a little bit of an optical illusion. You might say, man, sometimes it looks like it's in, sometimes it doesn't. Does anyone know why that is? We're not mental. It really is happening. It could be in on one side, but the other. Huh? It could be in on one side, but the other. The surface is smooth? Uh, that, no. So the surface is, is smooth for nice bearings. That's true. So say this is our block, and this is our hole and say we put it in at an angle so we see light here and not here, that's probably how it's going to be. Okay, say we do it flat, uh, flat, we still see light. The reason is they chamfered this. Anybody know what a chamfer is? 
So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw and zoom in. If this is the flange, that's what you think it is in theory. Now they cut that off. That's gone. That's got a chamfer. A chamfer is usually a 45 degree angle cut. And they do that so that you don't have sharp razor sh um, edges that will cut you. If we just left that at 90 degrees, it would probably cut you. So they do this to make things fit nicely and to reduce the, the, edge, the razor-esque. So that's a chamfer, and it looks sometimes like there's light, but it's not. It's just reflecting the light weirdly. Okay, go ahead and stick the shaft between the two bearings. Wait, how are you saying the satellite? Like Exactly. Okay, so everybody, you have an imaginary flashlight, go ahead. I'm ridiculous, we can all be ridiculous. And you've got your little part, and you're kind of doing this. You're trying to look and put the bearing flange in between the flashlight and your eyeball. Okay, now look at the shaft too. Look at both ends of the shaft. Do you see anything special about the end of that shaft? Jamfer! Now look at the bearing, pull the shaft out if you need to, and look at the inner race of the bearing. They all come out, I promise. Try, try a twisting doesn't work, yeah, there you go. Okay, now look at the inner race of the bearing. Is there anything special about the inner race of the bearing? Chamfer! Chamfer! Anytime that you are inserting a shaft into a hole, both must be chamfered. There are exceptions, we're not going over them in the class, it's a little bit, you know, you don't need to do that, but if we're going to uh, draw... Huh? How do you spell it? How do you spell this word? Chamfer. Oh. C-H-A-M-F-E-R. So, if this is our hole... Yes, I know, this is very hilarious. Um, <laughs> and this is our shaft. This will not work. I know, it's great. <laughs> They're not going to put this on YouTube. It will be censored. This will not insert. If you're trying to insert it and you think this is the right size and this is the right size and there's no goop or like adhesive on here and you just can't figure it out, it's because you didn't chamfer it. So instead, we're going to cut the chamfer there and there and there and there. And now this allows us, why? Primarily why are we doing this? Does anyone know? It causes it to move into the right spot. Yeah, it self-aligns. When you're just doing this, you're eyeballing it. It's not like you're, unless you are a robot, in which case you shouldn't be taking this course. <laughs> this axis is not perfectly aligned with this, and this chamfer helps auto-align it when you insert it. Okay, now go ahead and insert the shaft into the bearings, about halfway through. If you can't get it, kind of tap it on your desk. And if, it, if it's not going in a certain direction, don't force it, kind of wiggle it to try to get a different angle. Everybody good? Is anyone hopelessly not able to get it in? Okay. I brought a hammer for this reason. Okay. So, um, you didn't see me do this, and you will never do this, please. So, time to time, gunk gets in between the shaft and the race. That noise, that's bad. That means it's a little too much. Okay, now go ahead and take two of the shiny silver things, or sorry, one of them, and put it on one end of your shaft. The thin one. Okay, what are the thin ones called? What are the thick ones called? Shaft collars. The shaft collars keep it in place. So first... You were very specific that these are not washers. Exactly. Just terminology. Again, if you type in, uh, if you try to buy a washer, they will sell you a washer. It's not what you want. It's not the precision. It's not the thickness. Um, it, it's also not flat. Washers are. I mean, it's like the difference between buying a, uh, a little matchbox car and buying a Ferrari. In terms of, they're both sort of cars, but one of them is crappy and costs a dollar and doesn't do anything, and then the other one is like really nice. So. Um, <laughs> the inner race shim is really nice, and they're very expensive. So let's see, a pack of 30, sorry, a pack of 10, depending on which ones you get uh, on the company called Misumi, they're two bucks a pop, maybe, sometimes. Okay, so everybody got a shim on there? Yep. Can you use your hammer magic on this one? Yes. Um, 
So, just so you know, should you get in this unfortunate circumstance, you do not hammer the bearing. You take something much thinner than the shaft, you support this, which I don't have much of a way of doing, and you tap it. And the only reason why this is not breaking the bearing is because I got you special bearings that don't break easily. And, um, perfect, you're an example. Okay, I screwed up on the shaft. So, remember what I told you about tolerances? If I had, say I had a perfect tolerance, which doesn't exist, but say I had a perfect bearing, and it was exactly eight millimeter for the, for the bore. That's the hole where the shaft goes. How can I guarantee that my shaft will go in? in terms of tolerances. So my bearing is eight millimeter plus zero minus zero. It's eight millimeters. My shaft should be eight millimeters plus what and minus what? Zero minus zero. No. It should always be, um, so they'll actually specify that it's different. Yeah, it can't be plus. It'll be minus something and minus something. So maybe it'll be minus, uh, minus 0 0.02, minus 0 0.09. So the ones you get from Asumi, uh, it's, I think this one was a G6. So just to write real quick, just so you know, this is called a G6, and it's eight, and I think it was, uh, it was like, uh, uh, something like this, I don't, I don't really remember. Yeah, something like that. The numbers aren't quite right. The point is they're both minus. No matter what you do, it's still smaller than the bearing, so it goes in. The reason this one doesn't, some of yours fit and some of them don't, is that they specified plus zero minus this, which means that every now and then you get unlucky and you get a zero, and it means it's the exact same diameter as the hole, and so it just can't go in. So, most of your shafts in the class will just work. They'll just go in smoothly. Some of them won't. This is reality. If you want to build everything out of high tolerance parts that fit on the first try, you'll be building a billion dollar robot every time. Your advisor doesn't want to pay for that. They want to pay for the reasonable price one that's still pretty high quality. So if you are unlucky and you get a shaft like this, you use 400 grit for this. We'll go over that another time. Drill. You should have a dust mask and goggles also. Okay, now, this generated dust. We don't have a compressor up here. You want to spray down, get any dust off. It also, depending on how long you're doing, it will get hot. You want to have water to cool it, or you can use air to cool it. So assume that we just cooled this down and we just cleaned this out. And it fits one bearing and not another. And the reason why that is, is these bearings are not particularly high precision either. And so that means that some of them fit and some of them don't. This really is legitimate. This is not like me being hokey. This is it's the way that it's done. See, now it fits. Mm -hmm. I've done this a billion times. It's, it's not fun, but like I said, when, I, when it has to work on the first try and I'm not allowed to modify anything, I get the really expensive Masumi ones with the minus minus. When I can spend it a little bit of money, but not too much, I get the ones from McMaster. They're still pretty expensive, but they're plus zero minus something, so every now and then again, you have to sand it. Okay, everybody got a little tiny shim on there? Then put a shaft collar on there. Okay. Um, each row gets one Allen key because I forgot to order Allen keys. On one shim or two? One, only one. Each row gets uh, an Allen key. Actually, let's start this way. Sorry, Ellis, can I pass it down? Your shaft should be about halfway in between. And uh, you just want to tighten that screw, thereby locking in. There you go. We have four shifts, right? Yep. Don't use them all, only use one. 
Um, okay, everybody, there are, let me draw an Allen key for you. This is important. If you don't pay attention to this, you're going to be out of a lot of parts very soon. Allen key. It's a big L, right? Okay. Only ever twist with your hand on the little part for this class. So you can either twist like this, or you can twist like this. This has a bigger mechanical advantage. You will strip off all of your screws. By strip, I mean you will tear off chunks of metal and your screw will never be usable again. So for this class, and this class only, only ever grab it by the little one. Feel free to go as hard as you want, but use your common sense. Uh, so basically different screw sizes, and we'll go over this a different day. The bigger the screw, the harder it is to screw it and uh, up. So um, anything below uh, an M3, you need to be super careful. M3, eh, M4, you can crank on it. So go ahead and start tightening your shaft collars. Just the uh, I mean, it sh shouldn't move. Tight enough, it doesn't move. It does rotate, though. Should not rotate. Oh, so it's not tight enough? Oh, no, no, no. no th that'll rotate, but it's rotating with the shaft. Oh, I didn't even... So if you're curious that your shaft's still rotating... Yeah, there's just one. Yeah, so should be a bearing, and then a shim, and then a shaft collar. If there are questions, keep keep them coming. Two minutes. Yeah, only one. It depends. That one in your hand is about three bucks. I have ones that are eighty. Uh huh. Doesn't matter. Uh, some of them do. So imagine in your mind that the inter the inner race shim, the little tiny thing, and the shaft collar were one part. Now why would this be good? It's one less part. That's a big deal. Say that you had uh, 16 shaft collars to put on, which is how many you have to put on in lab one and then you have 16 shims. You could get rid of 16 parts in your robot. So anytime you can combine parts, you might want to. The difference is that then it's a special part and it's way more expensive. So if you're doing it at a company, they're gonna want less parts. They have the money compared to research lab. If you're doing it at a research lab, they probably want more parts but cheaper depending on the project. Uh-huh. What are the shims that is thinner than the bearing, part of the bearing? Yes, exactly. The problem is that this collar is too big. Uh, too wide. The diameter is too big. Good. That's our next step. So everybody kind of separate the bearing a little bit from that shaft collar so it's not smacked tight up against. And now eyeball it. The outer diameter of the shim doesn't come anywhere near the outer race. You see that? There's no way. It's physically impossible for it to touch the outer race. It only touches the inner race. Okay, now put it back with the shaft collar right next to the bearing, and it's questionable, depending on trying to remember. Can I see yours for a sec? That might scrape. The shielded ones, actually, it touches the shields. You guys got lucky. I think some of you have uh, sealed ones. That is way too close for comfort to have the shaft collar diameter near the outer race. So, again, the reason why we're using a shim is because it only touches the inner race, and then we can have whatever size shaft collar we want and it won't touch the bearing, outer race. Okay, now everyone put uh, one shim on the opposite side where there isn't anything. Actually put two of them, two of them, you've got four. So now that everyone has two on the opposite side, put that little conical thing, the black thing, the Belleville washer, and you can take it up and look at it. It's definitely not flat. Does the direction matter? Uh, nah, it doesn't really matter. Yep, yeah, that's fine. Other directions? Not to my knowledge. I've done it both ways. It works the same. Okay, now put your last remaining shim on top of the Belleville washer. Okay. 
And now finally put your last remaining shaft collar on top of that last shim. So I'm going to call out the direction of things. From the ball bearing on the opposite side, this is the loose side, we have a ball bearing. We have two little shims. Looking for something? Give an extra shim. Yeah. Okay, so we have the ball bearing, we have two shims, we have a Belleville washer, we have another shim, then we have a shaft collar. Everybody got that? Why the two before? Because you're about to see. Go ahead and hold it up like this in front of your eyes so that you can see that little Belleville washer. And now put your sand sandwich it with your fingers like this. Okay? Squish it. It's a spring. Everybody see that? The sole reason to have that little black thingy is it's a spring. And now I'm going to draw back again what that spring is doing. We are preloading the bearing. And I apologize. Um, we can't spend more than about a minute on this because we need to get the gears, which are a lot more interesting. Um, so remember, this is our race. And this is the ball. But actually, there's some play here. And we've got two of them. And because there's this play here, this space, we can shift them back and forth. There's axial motion. When we put a spring here, we're driving these balls to either end so that there's zero axial play. And the reason why we're using a spring instead of just smushing on it is so that we don't um, plastically deform this race and then you get the ka -kong, ka -kong, ka -kong. Now, if you're doing aluminum or steel, it's super important. If you don't use that spring, you're hosed. It will not work. You could get away with MDF without it. Does anyone know why? MDF is a spring. It's all about relative spring constants, right? The Belva washer, you're able to squish your fingers. Unless you're Superman, you cannot do that to, su to uh, aluminum or steel. But I can squish uh, MDF a little bit with my fingernails. Don't do that. You're going to break a nail. Um, I have done that, and then I have like gouged myself badly. So basically, MDF is, is pretty springy. So you can, you can do it by hand with some force, and it's fine. But this is the right way of doing it. So every time I see you guys using bearing, I want pairs, shims, one Belver washer, and some shaft collars, unless we're doing something special. OK. So what time is it? Oh my god. Okay. You're all tired. Go ahead and put this back in your bags or keep playing with them. Um, Rob, can you kill the camera for a second as I lower this? Yeah. Oh man, I should have had you pick up gears. Damn it. Take some back to your friends. Okay, we're, we're moving quickly. Gears. Again, please share with your neighbors. I want you guys to hold on to these gears, and I want you to bring them back to next lecture. If you don't have gears with you next lecture, next lecture is going to be very confusing and boring. Oh God, they're everywhere. Oh God. Ah, dude, seriously. Okay, here you go. Here you go. Uh, here you go. Oh, got some? Okay. Somebody know what these are called? Spur gears. The spur gear is the is the simplest and most common type of gear. They're everywhere. Someone please share back in the middle. The spur gear is the simplest. Most common type of gear, and that's what we're going to learn gear a little tiny bit of gear math on. The only reason we're doing this is because you'll use it so much, and it's the exact same math for a lot of belts. Are you recording? A lot of belts and a lot of cables. Um, so once you know gear math, you know belt math and most of cable math, although there's a little bit of extra. So go ahead and roll them in your hands. This is the whole point. You roll one and the other one rolls. It's a transmission. It transmits motion, transmits force, transmits power. It's a mechanical transmission. Um, 
Now I want you to take the big gear and squish it so it can't move. Take the little gear and move it back and forth, wiggle it. The fact that it can wiggle is backlash. It is inherent in a spur gear. You cannot get rid of it in a clean way. I'll show you something later, but it's hokey. I already told you backlash is application dependent in terms of whether or not it matters. For a little wheel, it probably doesn't matter. For a laser scanner, it, it kills it. There's no point in using it. And just uh, so that we can get it for the video camera, that's backlash right there. Nonlinear, discontinuous, can't control for it, can't get rid of it. You can mitigate it though. You can reduce its harmful impact. And I will show you that another day. But for now, in, our, in the twilight of our lecture. Two questions for you. Yeah. Um, do you have an end effect or no condition like that you control for that? Because it's nonlinear and discontinuous? Okay. So we got one gear and we have two gears. Why are there no teeth? Because I don't want to do tooth math. This is called the pitch circle. This is the circle of contact. This is the ideal razor thin circle that when you're talking about two gears, this is where uh, the uh, teeth are actually the point of contact. So your two sp spur gears can be reduced to two circles and they have diameters D1 and D2. So this is our input and this is the output. So why do we want to use gears in the first place? I told you it's a transmission. We want to transmit um, motion, torque, those together are power. But why do we use, uh, say, uh, well, anyway. Basically, if you have one shaft here, but it really needs to be there, use a gear. Maybe you have a tiny little motor and it's just super weak and you want to increase its torque, use a gear. And we're about to explain it how. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to go fast, but we can go over this again. I'm going to put in a torque T1. I'm going to twist my shaft. Okay? Which direction is this gear going to move? Yeah. Now, why? All of you got that very quickly, but tell me why. Tell me about this point. Moving down. Okay? So, does everyone know the relation in terms of linear to rotary motion? We have some delta S equals R d theta, okay? And so now we're going to differentiate and we get a, a ds dot equals an r d theta dot. So let's take the velocity at this point. It's moving smoothly. One's not slipping past the other. It can't. It's got teeth. The velocity here uh, with respect to this gear is the same as with respect to here. So let's call that v contact. Can everyone see if I write here? No? All right. Uh, let me go up here. So, let's look at it from the perspective of this gear. V contact is D1 over 2 times theta 1 dot. Does everyone agree with that? Okay. Now let's do it with respect to the second gear. It's D2 over 2 theta 2 dot. Okay. So we'll cancel out the 2's. And then we're left with theta 2 dot is d1 over d2 theta 1 dot. And this is called in. That's your gear ratio. So what this means is depending, say they're the same gears and d1 and d2 are the same, they cancel out. That means I spin this at a given velocity and I get the same velocity here. Okay? Now say d one's tiny, as we've written here. That means theta 2 is going to spin more slowly than theta 2. So now take your gears, spin the little gear, actually take your pin and mark a, a radial stripe along the little one and a radial stripe along the big one. Just straight across both of them. Now rotate the little one. Do two turns, three turns, however many you want. Notice that you get fewer turns out of the big one. You're putting in X rotations 
you're getting out less than x rotations. That's this gear ratio. Now this is just velocity. So now let's look at torques. So a torque tau is equal to the radius and f. We're playing it, we won't worry about cross products. So now let's do it for the first gear. Tau 1, oh. So the torque here, or the force here, now let's call that a force instead of a velocity. And it's an equal and opposite reaction force, so it's identical. So tau 1 is d1 over 2 f1. That means that f1 is tau 1 over d1. Everybody see that? The force here is, um, and I think I forgot a 2. Yeah, there's a 2 there. It would be better if you just like stuck the radius everywhere, right? Yeah, but everybody, we'll, we'll get to that. There's a term called the pitch diameter, and everyone uses it. All the math is in terms of radii. Buying gears is always in terms of diameter, so we have to mix them. Okay, so that was for everybody to get that. So we've got a force here, and we've got a radius. So now force 1 is 2 tau over d1. And then f2 is 2 tau 2 over d2. But the force is the same, so when we set them equal to each other, we're left with tau 2 is d2 over d1 tau 1. Does everyone see this? Please let me know. It's simple, but I'm going quickly and writing badly. So notice that the ratio here is the inverse of this. Here it's d1 over d2, and here it's d2 over d1. I'm going I'm to write it up here so everyone can see it. Tau 2 is d2 over d1 tau 1. It's the inverse relationship. So with this little gear, if we spin it at one velocity, here it's a lower velocity. But if we spin with one torque here, here it's a higher torque. Does anyone know what mechanical power is in terms of math? Yeah. So mechanical power P is torque times theta dot. Theta dot is the distance. Well, theta dot is the angular velocity. So theta dot is in rads per second. That's radians or, or uh, degree measurements um, per second. So let's multiply out what's, what's the input power. P1 is tau 1 theta 1 dot. Okay? P2 is tau 2 theta 2 dot. Okay, that's fine. And now let's substitute in. Tau 2 is d2 over d1 tau 1. Theta 2 dot is d1 over d2 theta 1 dot. Anybody see what's happening here? They cancel. Tau 1 theta 1 dot. So that means, yes, I just heard it out there. The power in is the power out. Thermodynamics is not incorrect, thank God. Practically, it actually, this is lesser. So if you're trying to figure out, okay, well I need this much power on my output, you're going to lose power somewhere in here. There's efficiency. So practically, P2 is going to be some efficiency times P1, where efficiency is less than 1. And uh, for spur gears, it's around 98%. It's pretty good. Okay, so that was for a simple gear. Is everyone cool on this? If you're not cool on this, we're going to be screwed later on. You just arbitrary pick input and output, right? Yeah. Okay. I always move left to right. So, uh, mm -hmm. the step that you did after delta s, the yep. e s, why did you put those dots? Oh, dot for me means time derivative. Because I wanted to be talking about theta dots. So, like, right, so it's just s dot. Theta yeah. So it's just s dot equals uh, r theta dot. Right. I'm just confused because you have a d and a dot. Yeah, that's actually acceleration. Hmm? I mean, delta s is already like velocity. Yeah, the, uh, sorry. Yeah. The first one is already in velocity. Velocity, we'll use that. Th yeah, this, it doesn't matter. this is a linear velocity. This is an angular velocity. We call, could call this omega if we want. Depends on whether or not you're doing, you know, which teacher you've had. So I, that converts linear velocity and angular velocity. Okay? So this is the gear ratio in. Now, spur gears have a couple definitions with them. And I'm going to draw it over here. If this is my circle and these are my teeth, the, 
that, that, that point that I drew, that theoretical pitch circle, that this is where the other gear meshes, that's called the pitch circle and its diameter is PD, pitch diameter. The distance from any point on a tooth to the exact same point on the other tooth, measured in millimeters, is the pitch P. Okay? What did you write? Uh, P, and that's pitch in millimeters. Is that distance along the curve? Or distance, distance along a curve. So, so this is not a straight line. This is a, on a circle. It's a segment, an arc. You can't use two gears together of different pitches. They have to be the same pitch. When you're buying gears and you're looking at, oh, I want this many teeth, but oh, they only have it in this pitch, doesn't matter. Always the same pitch, they won't fit. And I'm sure you can see why that one tooth has to fit in here. If it's a different pitch, it can't fit. Because they have to be the same pitch, the way this is defined, that gear ratio doesn't have to be defined in terms of pitch diameter. It can also be a ratio of number of teeth. So if we were to count the teeth on there, say, I don't know, um, say one pitch diameter was 10 millimeters and had uh, 10 teeth, and the other was 100 millimeters and had 100 teeth, <coughs> the ratios are the same. Yeah? Is there a standard for teeth geometry? Because I can imagine yes. having the same so in terms of teeth, there are two types. Involute and cycloidal. Unless you are doing some really crazy stuff, you will never see cycloidal. 99.9% .9 of the gears people ever use are involute. There is a crap ton of math to do with this and geometry and tangents and weird curves that get intersected. You don't need to know it, it's not important. Feel free to Wikipedia it, but I'm not teaching it because I don't find it important. You must match pitch. Pitch, same, both gears. Just so you know, half the time that you see metric gears, it's not called pitch, it's called module. Just to screw with you, that's why. <laughs> you cannot mix metric and imperial gears. So I don't even know how they define it because I just don't use imperial stuff. But say you found um, a spur gear that's imperial with a pitch of 24, and I don't even know what that is because it doesn't make physical sense to me. Um, you can't then look and try to find the closest looking metric gear. The geometries won't work out. So can't mix. U.S. metric gears. Okay, so now that we know what pitch is, distance between the teeth along the arc, the pitch diameter, the diameter of that pitch circle where they're rolling against each other, let's put them together. There's no reason why we just have to have planar gears. Has everybody seen this? Can everyone actually see what I'm pointing at? You see how I have a little gear on top of a big gear? These are rigidly attached. When I spin the little gear, the whole thing moves. This little gear is bolted and is concentric with the big gear. When you have two gears rigidly attached to each other, that's called a compound gear. Anyone know why we use a compound gear? We want even more torque. So compound gears are how you do um, Gear trains. Let me see what time it is. Six. Six? Almost. Okay, so we're going to do one last derivation, two, and then we're done. a little gear here and then a big gear here 
And then it's a compound gear. So I have another gear concentric here, and then another gear here. Okay? We're going to spin this one, tau, uh, tau one, tau two, and then um, which direction does this gear spin? Why? Yep. Good. Okay. So that means when we come around here, we're spinning that way. So which way is this gear spinning? Yeah. Okay. So that's tau four. So I'm not going to do every single little bit of math. Obviously, this is D1. This is D2. This is. The, I'll, I'll at least n n label them. So everyone knows the, th the third gear is the little gear on top of the number two. Okay? So we know because we just derived tau 2 is d2 over d1 tau 1. And we also know that uh, t4 is d4 over d3 tau 3. It's the exact same thing, right? This is in plane and this is in plane, so we're fine. What's missing is that tau 3 equals what? Tau 2. Tau 2. And why is that? They're rigidly coupled. This is the exact same part. I can't separate them. Any torque I put on 2, I put on 3. Any torque I put on 3, I put on 2. That's why tau 3 equals tau 2. Okay, so now we have, can everyone see what I'm doing? Tau 4 is now D4 over D3, and let's plug in T3. That's T2, let's plug in T2. D2 over D1, tau 1. Okay, so now we have D4, D2 over D3, D1, tau 1. So just to make the math easy, let's say this is a diameter of 1, 1, 10, and 10. Then that's 10 times 10, over 1 times 1 tau 1, that's 100 tau 1. So by using a compound gear, just one gear to another, we got a gear ratio of 10. We used a compound gear, and now we have a, a gear ratio of 100. So we're either a lot slower or a lot higher torque. Now there is a problem with this and its material property. It's that the force here at the contact point between 3 and 4 is a lot higher force than here. Anybody know why? Because you're using the same torque on, D on 3, which has a smaller diameter than 2. Yes. As our torques go up, but our radii are not, our force is going up. So, um, just to show you real, real quickly, uh, let's call this, um, let's call this, uh, this is force contact 2, force contact 1. The force contact 2 is tau 4 over d4 over 2. Okay, that's just a simple thing. And then t4 over d4, um, and now let's, let's plug in what t4 is. This is getting messy. What's the first? This here? No, 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 no. Uh, FC2. That's the, that, that's the contact point between the two top gears. Okay? So we've got uh, 2 over D4, and then we've got D4 over D3, D2 over D1, tau 1. Where did this come from? It's right, uh, right here, see? D4, D2 over D3, D1. Okay? Um, these cancel out, and then we're left with 2D2 over D3, D1, tau 1. So this is what F contact 2 is right now. Now over here, let's do, over here we'll do F contact 1. This one's really easy. F contact 1 is tau 1 over D1 over 2, which is 2 tau 1 over D1, okay? So all we have to do is plug these two together, and we get 2d2 over d3 d1. Um, boom, boom, 
D2 over D3 FC1. Okay, does anyone see why this is working? 2T1 over D1. 2D2 over D1. So now we're plugging in, it's T1. Yeah, you plug in times T1, FC1 over 2. Cancel. Yeah, so it cancels. So in the end, we're left with F contact 2 is D2 over D3, F contact 1. So these gear ratios are canceling out so that the only ratios that matter here is the ratio between this gear and this gear on the compound gear. That is, we don't care what gear 1 is or what gear 4 is. The increase in tooth loading on the gears that we're getting is solely the proportion of the diameters on the compound gear. Now the reason this matters is you want to use plastic gears if you can because they're cheap. But plastic gears are weak, they break. You'd like to usually use like bronze instead, it's stronger. But if you're going to use bronze, it's more expensive. So if I wanted um, to use two gears, plastic and bronze, where would I use them here? Say uh, I want to use, um, I want to use uh, gear one and gear four. Which should be plastic and which should be uh, bronze? One should be uh, bronze. Four should be plastic. One is plastic. One and two can be plastic. One and two can be plastic. Three and four have to be bronze depending on the loads. But if we had to pick two, that's what we'd pick. Because one and two is only FC1. F contact two is a much bigger contact than is um, number one. We multiplied it. In our, in our little scenario, remember where D2 is 10 and three is one? Then um, that's 10 over one. So. That's 10 F contact 1. So that means that this force is times 10 this force. So if we are going to use cheap little gears that are plastic, we use it here. If we're going to use really strong gears, we're going to use it here out of bronze. And I think we're out of time. The first thing we're going to do next lecture is I've dissected something that I bought. It's a motor. It's a gear head. And just I'll show you. I'll just project it really quickly. Can everyone see that white gear? Can someone turn on the lights? Thanks. See that white gear? That's a really cheap little plastic gear. The black gears are probably a much more expensive gear, an exotic uh, plastic that's much more expensive. And uh, the final one on here is metal, I believe. So because the white one is early on right off the motor shaft and has such low contact loads, it doesn't need to be strong. And as we get towards the output where it's much higher contact loads, we need a stronger, more advanced material to take the loads. So that's why that math matters. Uh, I flew through the last part. I promise you it does work. I did it yesterday and everything canceled. Um, if that doesn't make sense, come and see me after class. Okay, make we're done. Gears and then they fix less load. Huh? If you make bigger gears, does it make it mean you get less load? If you make a bigger gear, it'll give you a lesser tooth load, yes. Usually you're constrained in terms of um, spacing. So the problem is if you want to get from here to here, so you're going to use one little gear and one giant gear, well now your device is that big. So then you'd probably want to use like a belt, actually. Belts are basically just super freaking long skinny gears in a way, and we'll get to that in another lecture. Or bigger teeth on your, on your higher loaded Or bigger teeth. Or pitch. Yep. Yeah, going back to that term, uh, pitch. So if, if we made the teeth bigger and had higher pitch, then we could take more loads. Now, can you raise your hands, all of those who know what the term means, Young's modulus? Just about all of you. Okay. So basically, these teeth want to shear off. If I were to draw, extrude this into the board, this little rectangle, it wants to rip that tooth off. Do you see that? It just wants to shear it right off. It wants to make a circle out of a toothed gear. And so the area, so that's, that uh, shear stress tau, or actually I don't want to confuse you with torque, 
we'll just call it sigma, um, is uh, the force over the area. Well, the force is the same because it's the same gear. If we have a higher uh, area, then the stress goes down and we don't end up plastically deforming or just shearing it off. So bigger pitch means bigger area, means lower stress, means you're not going to break your gear. What's it's a larger gear. I don't know why, but people are always obsessed with handheld devices. I prefer mine to require forklifts personally, but um, everyone wants small gears for small devices. And so uh, the other thing is uh, if you want um, the same gear ratio with a larger pitch, your overall gear has to be much bigger. So smaller teeth mean you can have a more compact but still high gear ratio. Yes? More you know, I don't actually know. I'm not sure. That's an excellent question. I don't know. It has to do with how well the envelope Yep. So this is basically, lab one is the only time you're going to build a compound gear train. It's also poss possibly the only time you'll ever build it in the real world too. Most of the times that you want high gear reductions, you use a gear head. A gear head is a bunch of these in a nice compact little unit. You put the input shaft, you take the output shaft, and you're done. It's very clean. They're actually pretty cheap depending on what you get. And you're done. You don't have to calculate any of this stuff. They give you a specification. They say, here's how much torque you put in, here's how much torque you get out, don't exceed these forces or these torques. They take care of all of the teeth loading and everything and you don't have to worry about it. I'm just showing you this because you do need to know where gear ratios come from. And basically, I can never remember like which side the D2 and which side the D1, so I just quickly rederive it whenever I forget. Um, so I do, I, I do expect you all to be able to do this derivation. We're not going to have a test, but I will come and bug you in the lab and we're going to go through it together. Um, so yeah, next, next lecture, we're, I'm going to show you some gear heads. I'm going to show you what they look like, what the types are. Um, and if I give you a mysterious motor labeled A and I don't tell you what the gear ratio is, I'm going to have you tell me what the gear ratio is. We'll also talk about back drivability and reflected inertia if you care to research those terms. Okay, so we're done. You want the hex keys back, I assume? Everything. Uh, uh, so, okay, so any thin section bearings, any Allen keys, I need back, please. And USB sticks. Solidworks, we get, when we do that, we do that downstairs. Yes. For Solidworks, Please don't pop by the lab because it's, it's uh, very full. If you have come by and ma made, uh, 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 if you've set up uh, online uh, hours, feel free to come by at those hours. And if you don't have hours, please sign up. So you